All right, so now we go to Yoros with Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. <laughs> so last time I gave an introduction on uh, writing contracts, what was involved, what were the possibilities and uh, the limits there. Uh, showed you a couple of code examples and a couple of projects that could help you uh, building them. Um, now I want to dive into one specific type of contract. I'm a bit self-conscious when I'm used to the word contract now, thanks to you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I want to talk about decentralized autonomous organizations. So DAO, what's, what, what, what is this? So this refers to an autonomous entity, maybe some kind of crypto person, in contrast to a legal person or a natural person. It, it resides on the blockchain, but there's no, there's no central control. There's no person or company behind it uh, controlling it, at least not the central one. It, it doesn't depend on any existing legal contracts or organizational bylaws. It is really self-contained in respect to the rules that it lives by and, and, and dies by. And all its resources, all its funds, all its ether that it has under control, um, it manages itself. So with its own public private keys, it can send transactions, receive transactions, uh, call other contracts, and, and try to make impact on the on the world. And the entire thing, it's self-enforcing. It lives on the on the on the blockchain. It gets executed, and all the rules are known uh, uh, to to Ethereum and to people to people reviewing it. So this was a. Utopia until a couple of years ago. Now with with blockchain and Bitcoin, Bitcoin <coughs> technologies, we can start thinking about this this kind of concept. I think it's first int introduced in 2009. The the, the word uh, decentralized autonomous organization, and now people really start thinking. Well, well, what's possible? What is the scope of this? How can we actually apply this? But first of all, why why would you need this? I can can think of a couple couple reasons. Um, such organizations they would be invulnerable or at least very robust to internal corruption, like a board of directors that is uh, not behaving well. You, you won't have that in, in this contract unless you explicitly program ill-behaving directors as part of your contract itself. Um, also to outside force. So if you live in, in, a, in a country, maybe a Horn of Africa, where you can't really rely on the, on the, the police and the, and the legal system, um, external parties, they cannot really try to, 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 to change the behavior of your, of your organization. Um, and thinking of a internet scale, worldwide, 24-7 economy, uh, decentralization scales a lot better than central resources. Uh, if you try to, to go to a single website, you have this, this, this uh, slash dot effect. Now by just moving servers away, from, from central locations, the uh, internet becomes much more robust. With, uh, with torrent, with torrent, you can do massive downloads that really scale with the, the usage. And I think also these contracts, they will really scale uh, the, the utilization of this organization. Maybe it's interesting that they can be low cost compared to existing system, but we, we don't know yet. I think the uh, lawyers have, the, have, the, have the, at least the name to be expensive. Uh, but we don't know, maybe Ethereum will be much more expensive and you really start to appreciate your current legal system and lawyers if you think of this. <laughs> this legal cost. So we, we yet have to see. Um, one, one thing I didn't think of until I saw uh, the, the previous presentation is this, this concept, well, how did you phrase it in the end, the, the, the third uh, rule where you're not so... Spaces. Decision spaces, right? So you're not so well set into one line and then you, you're really baked into that decision forever until you come with a new revision of your contract, your contract can start modifying itself. Maybe it can start some kind of internal trial and error, A-B testing of various arbitration services or shipping services or external enforcement services of trying multiple data feeds and which ones have the biggest satisfaction, the biggest return of value or the biggest whatever decision, whatever metric you define to be. So this can be really fluid and, and interesting. So with Ethereum, the promise there that you can build this this system. So your distributed autonomous organization it will live as a contract on the blockchain, or more likely as a as a bunch of contracts living together, calling it with each other, communicating with each other. Uh, 
such a contract, it has its own Ethereum address by which it's publicly known. And by, by means of that address, it can receive payments and it can, uh, well, you can inspect its state. It's just the same, uh, it just looks the same as another, any kind of Ethereum address out there. So uh, you can make a payment to, to, um, well, to, to Jared, to, to his address, or I can make a payment to this, this contract address. And then at that point, this organization will receive the funds. Um, it can also send and receive transactions itself. Of course, you need to program it to, to do so uh, up front. Um, and it is actually activated, it's, it's hibernating once it's there on the blockchain until somebody out there sends it uh, uh, an initial transaction. So it needs to be triggered. You need to pay this, this gas thing that, uh, that uh, Jared was referring to. So you need to pay the cost to run the, the contract uh, satisfactorily enough to, to, to fully execute. And at that point it will fully evaluate, change its own state, make outgoing transactions, etc. And then it, again, it will sleep until somebody else is calling it again. You, you had a question? No, I, I, exactly that. Yeah. What you said. So there are some future changes, plans for this, where you could also have a contract call itself into future after this many confirmations on the blockchain, but this is still a work in process. Uh, you can always, of course, make an external service that will just call a contract at a certain interval and get paid for, for doing so. Contract itself, it has its own memory and persistent storage, and it's, it's, it can be huge. You have to pay for storage, but potentially you can store a lot of state, a lot of data, a lot of users, a lot of shareholders, a lot of uh, uh, data points on, on there. And with the recent changes, the contract can also return a value. So your company, your organization, it also has an API. So you can call the organization, what is your uh, I don't know, what's your latest decision, or is this person a member of your organization, or what was your, uh, please send me a transaction, or please consider this donation, or anything, kind of uh, any request you want to send to it, and it can return um, you with a value. And by doing this, you can use another organization, another contract, as a function within your contract. So maybe my decentralized shipping agency can be used from another contract and just be called as if it was an API function available uh, already. <laughs> all the rules of a contract, so also all the rules of this organization, they need to be developed, need to be compiled, and they need to be stored as Ether script, as this Ethereum bytecode on the, on the blockchain. And this is publicly unknown. I mean, at least bytecodes, it might not be that understandable, but you can reverse engineer it. You could infer what, is, what, is, uh, what it is doing. It is deterministic. And of course, you can have all kinds of programming libraries, all kinds of legal libraries where the source code is known, you can compile them, you can link them in, and you can inspect if it compiles to the same bytecode as if it's used by your uh, contract, so you could compare and audit that the contract is really doing what you claim it to, to, uh, to do. What, if, what happens if I put a patent into the blockchain? Um, yes, interesting. We have, to, we have to see. I mean, already storage is... is uh, do you want to repeat the question? So, okay, so the question was, what happens if I put a patent in the blockchain? Yes, I came up with something, I make it self-sustaining, what a patent. Yeah. It's mine, if you want to use it, call return. So I think then maybe the, the, the patent agency will try to call your decentralized autonomous organization and try to have this patent removed. Um, if that's going to succeed, <laughs> <laughs> it depends right. if that's going to succeed or not. Or does anybody get paid, or how does that work? Uh, that's that's not defined. I mean, you could you can you could put some kind of licensing fee. So every code execution, uh, you can put that in. Uh, how you say that? Uh, voluntarily. So I know that I'm including this patent, and each time my code gets executed, I send the owner of this patent. Uh, a certain a certain part of my income, but you could also decide not to do so, and then somebody can try to enforce it, but that will hey, most likely fail. If I put the patent in there and I um, like link it to like Greenpeace, yes, I just give it away to Ethereum, yeah, and it hooks up to Greenpeace, so they get the. 
Sure. So the question is, can you make your patent payments go to Greenpeace? I, I think I so. Know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like we have to. You have to. You have to see. It, it's the same kind of machine. Yeah. For good things. Yeah, you can you can use it for good. You can use it for for bad. You can you can decide to code your moral guidelines and rules as part of code. I'm and a lawyer, so my moral guidelines are pretty okay. Okay, but then <laughs> the the big the big change is the big change is that you're not relying on a board of directors to enforce it, but you're relying on the on the source code. Whatever you code it, it it can basically do uh, uh, what you tell it to do. So you can make a contract for good. You can make a contract for for evil. And you can even more cooler, you can make a script that can modify its own code. So you can start with uh, with, uh, with the version A, and on the fly, members or shareholders of a contract they can they can vote uh, on on modifying it. Or this can even be done automatically based on A/B testing, best benefit, best kind of external external metric. Maybe you can even outsource have the contract outsource updating itself, do some kind of ELANS service, and then it will try a lot of alternatives, and it will also connect with another party that does the, the testing for it. Um, so the sky is the limit. A contract can become a virus? Yeah, yeah a contract can also be a virus too, and uh, maybe that's why there's a lot of people here from AVG that are interested in, uh, in Ethereum. But the contracts are executed in a sandbox, so they don't to have who? the opportunity to connect to, uh, to your computer or to the outside world. They won't be able to connect to the internet. So, so as, Nick was, as Nick was saying, a contract can do a lot, but it cannot make it cannot make calls to websites. The, the the interaction with the outside is pretty limited. It can only receive incoming transactions, and it can update its own state, and it can make outgoing transactions. It cannot access randomly access your hard drive. It cannot call your mother. It cannot do these kind of things. If you want those kind of things to happen, you would need to set up some kind of some kind of proxy that does this for you and that gets paid to, to do this. So if you want to have any kind of real world interaction, um, you have to you have to implement it. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I have another question with the pattern example. Yes. Uh, it's nice if between two parties you say we have a patent here, but if a third party breaches the patent, yeah. uh, in the real world we're living in now, yeah. they will say, well, this is not the patent. So where did you come into <coughs> that you can reinforce <coughs> the rest of the world that this is a patent they cannot breach? Because if you go to court saying I have a patent in Ethereum, they'll say, well, that's very but, nice, but man. But in the global in the global world, I think the entire thing of patent law is already quite depending on where you live and on where you where you do your business. If I have my patents here and I go to China, they might well, not be you, respected. You register in a certain country yeah. or in a certain yeah. jurisdiction, yeah. etc. Yeah. So where do you merge the pattern you have in the system to the what's working now in the real world to really make it work. Maybe that gets back to the constitution that uh, that you explained. There is a funnel based on which you define yeah. exactly. this is a breach, this is not a breach. So, so a lot of these things are not defined yet. I think there are a lot of ideas out there, but basically we have to see how this is going to, to, to work. Maybe people will respect certain legal uh, contract, legal agreements uh, uh, voluntarily and build them in as part of their system and this will become part of a reputation management where people will only use these kind of various contracts because they are, are opting into these kind of clauses. But that's that's way too early to how uh, you can think about it, but there's no answer to, to that yet. But yours, if I understand you right, these ideas that are now on the table, are our application type of things that probably will be developed by users of Ethereum as an infrastructure. So yeah. I don't think that these things will develop internally by Ethereum no. as capabilities, but as a user community, you must develop these things yourself yeah. and you use the Ethereum infrastructure. And so then you get into the situation for where uh, Mr. Kuhlman explained how you define these things and how broad or how narrow. Yeah. Exactly. If you're a patent lawyer, start studying Ethereum. There's meant to be a clash between smart property and IP because IP it creates uh, a lot of restrictions on creativity and all these things like that. So this is uh, this is culture 2.0. That's what we're talking about. Yes. Okay. That's only if you're great thing. IP. And I, I see the restrictions uh, to what I'm asking. But uh, what what basis 
do we use the U, U, uh, United, uh, U, uh, United Nations? Are we using it there? You yes, yes, yes but okay, but <laughs> no. Yeah. Is there a basic set no. of no. Uh, no. humanity no. we're going to use in this? No. There is, if we all agree on it. You yeah, so like I mean, a patent office could create their own kind of contract or API uh, and then start getting various contract developers to enforce or call their API. Uh, and that would be a, that, that particular part would be a, a social problem more than uh, something that would be built into Ethereum. But then going back to that funnel, that foundation would then be set for anybody who uses those various other contracts that already integrate and plug into the patent office's DAO, for example. I think it's, if you think of the, the open source, source world, uh, I think GPL was probably one of the first open, well-known open source licenses. It was only the version one or version two of it. And then really started to spread and people started to adopt. Uh, you got new versions and just uh, this is this will be evolving over time. Maybe the first will be one one implementation of it. Will be multiple of it, depending on where you live. You might have certain preferences, or maybe even be re be required to pick one one library. But that that's that's that doesn't exist. That doesn't exist yet. Right. Uh, just as an example of a of a very well very simple DAO. This is a egalitarian DAO. This is the one from the Ethereum white paper. Um, the the main goal here is that the members it's a egalitarian one because every every member has the same has the same white uh, the, the same weight when they're they're voting for a code change so this the members uh, of this contract they can propose a change of the contract code itself then the members can vote on it if there's a two-third majority on the code change somebody else needs to trigger it and then the code will the, the contract will update its own its own rules its own codes and then exist in that new version to to uh, 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 forever of afterwards and of course it can be updated again and again and again. Uh, where does that code then come from, and how do they choose from different pieces of code? So I can very on a high level just go to through this. Um, so what's interesting, there's a little bootstrapping clause. So if you look at the, the last three lines, it says basically, if this con contract hasn't been initialized, then I at least make, create one member of this contract, and this is the person that has the address C. So that could be you as the creator, or maybe your employer for, for who you make this, this contract, or maybe you could appoint, appoint a random uh, person from the from the blockchain, you can. You need to start, of course, with a with a contact. Yes, here we're bootstrapping with one member. You could bootstrap with five members or ten members or have this. I think this is also part of this. Where does this contract become a contract that Casey was talking about? So you need this this contract bootstrapping, this little initialization. Jasper? Yeah. Um, uh, could some could you? put that contract on the blockchain and then someone else comes and steals your investment of paying for that code. Could that happen? So yeah. the contract will be compiled to EVM bytecode, just like if you're writing Java, it will be compiled to JVM bytecode, but everybody can try to decompile that and to use that intellectual property. Um, so. Actually, I think a lot of Ethereum contracts will be made open source just because it doesn't make any sense to keep them to your to yourself. So well, I, that's not exactly what I meant. I mean, what I meant was uh, you put it on the on the blockchain and you pay the fees for yes, yeah. putting it on the blockchain. Yeah. And then someone else comes to uh, with uh, to set the contract. The okay. Story. So that's why the in, in as part of the initialization, you want to make sure that you are the person that can initialize the contract. So you will be actually hard coding your own address as part of this bootstrap code. Otherwise, you could have some kind of free lifter take over your code as soon as you as you upload it to the blockchain. If that's a problem or not, also, of course, depends on what this is actually going to cost to execute. If it's very cheap, you might not even care. You might just be uploading millions and millions of contracts per day. If it's very expensive, then you really want to make sure that it's only you that is the controlling party. And that nicely ties in with some of these other boilerplate checks. So line one and two, forget about it. This is going to remove with this uh, gas system. But 
lines three and four, it checks if the, 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 the sender, so the person that's triggering this contract, if he's a member. So if his address is known in this entire contract storage space of this contract, then he can manipulate the state of this organization. If he's an outsider, if he's a free rider trying to hijack the contract, you just ignore him. Of course, you could also modify it to just listen and offer him a limited set of commands or just offer him a higher price to modify it or maybe just a, a public market where he can buy and sell sell shares. Question? Yeah, so I'm wondering, can we sort of, is it possible on, the, on, on Ethereum to sort of say, well, this is like this kind of contract and then we, we it exposes certain yeah. like an API or something and then actually you don't need to write all this boilerplate if you want this kind of contract, but you actually have like three functions you just, this is the, the bootstrapping, I just can bootstrap all this code and I just provide the, the you know, the, the participants in the contract. Right, so <coughs> probably we'll be seeing libraries, package management things, you, contracts can call other contracts and, and return and then act on the, the, the return of another contract. So you can use a contract as a function and you say, I just want to import my 67% membership ship voting library there and then my dividend payout there and then my yearly evaluation of my arbitrage clause from, from that part. So you could be t combining things together, but at this point, none of this exists. So you'd have to implement all these functions. So version one will be you doing everything yourself. You'll be open sourcing it, and then people will start contributing, reusing it. So this needs to grow over time, but it is certainly possible to, to do it that way. Is that, also, is that the way? Like to sort of reuse so that you actually this is this is the future we have to see how that it, it sounds to be the way yeah. but if it's actually going to be used that way we, we have to see it might be ah, different okay. tomorrow yeah it is possible yeah you don't necessarily have to abstract you can no yeah. no i think it's then it's like open source it's it's far easier to then use open source libraries because most of the time things are done for you then yeah question how can you stop If I start keep hitting this contract, it's nonsense sellers. So this is a big, so the question was, how can I prevent my uh, uh, contract from being, well, basically having a denial of service attack performed uh, against it. That was interesting, if you have a conqueror. So uh, this, was a, this used to be a problem in the current version of the, the, the POC version three. So that is why this contract would need to check that if the person that is calling the contract, if he was sending enough Ether to, to basically pay pay the fee for executing it. That's going to change. Yeah, but there's still one step. The, f the first 16 steps used to be free. So you had a little free 16 steps, and after the 16 step, the meter started to started to run. This is going to change. Now the, the, the caller needs to pay for everything, but he can set his fee and what is the step fee basically is that he's willing to pay. That way you can also have some kind of little market between miners, which miner is the cheapest one and which will be picked to, to run the contract by. But if somehow your contract is not, is taking more steps than you paid fee for, everything that it, that, uh, that it, uh, that it modified will be rolled back, but you still, you still lose the, the money for it. So it's not possible anymore to perform such a denial of service attack on the contract. And it also removes a little bit of this boilerplate that everybody was including in the beginning. But, yes, yeah. the, the, but the fact that it uh, took all these steps until it realized that it doesn't have enough gas to yeah. it, doesn't it uh, then also cause computational steps and <coughs> as such uh, could be used as a denial? Of well, they will take computational steps, but yeah. for those computational steps, you still need to pay so you're paying for every step until you're out of money. So that is the prevention, that, that's how they're trying to prevent mm -hmm. this from becoming a denial of service attack. Of course, what the actual price will be and then where this will settle on, we, we have to we have to see. Another question in the back? It was me, but you had Okay, excellent. So now, important thing is, here people are voting on some kind of change. And whatever the change is, is, this, is part of the transaction that is sent to it from one of its users or from another contract that is using using this contract. Um, and then based, based, basically you can call it with, with the zero, number zero, with the number one, or with the number two. So that's what line six, 10, and 19 are about. So if you call it the number zero, you're saying, I want to propose a code change. And then, um, no, sorry, with the number zero, it says I'm voting for this code change. So it checks, have you already voted on this code change before, 
If not, it registers your vote and it increments the amount of people that have voted for it. Note that just by voting of it, it doesn't check every time if it reached the threshold. That will need to be explicitly triggered by somebody, somebody else, because otherwise it would be too expensive to, to vary this, verify this all the time. Um, so if you want to propose a code change, you send it the, the number one. And you need to pay the, a lot because quite a few steps need to be taken. So that's why it checks that you paid enough money to copy all the data for all the staging data for your code change that will be persisted in the in the contact storage. It will loop over all the the the, the arguments of your transaction and it will store it in the contract storage. And then it will on line 17 it will count you yourself, at least as the, the first voter for this code change, it assumes that you, as the as the proposer of this code change, that you, at least you are in agreement and you want to have this, this change. Um, and then it's just ready to be voted on. So all this communication, what this change actually does and why you did it, etc., that that is all out of the scope of this. That could be established on forums and you could just have some kind of hash value or some kind of signed value as identifier that will be used to, to check and mark these, these changes. And then if you send it the number two, it checks the amount of people that have voted for it. Is this more than two thirds of the total amount of members of my, of my organization? And if so, it will copy the data that was staged to this, uh, to, well, to overwrite its own storage. And after that, it will run the new code that was there. Of course, if you make a bug, if you propose a code change that has some kind of horrible bug from the beginning, like accidentally having the line stop as the first instruction, your entire organization is blown up and there is no, there's no government to bail you out anymore. Could you include a failover uh, concept? That's um, even if you rewrite your uh, subset, that you include a class as first thing if it is excess in x number of days, then it will rebuild its old. Uh... So you could still agree on some kind of bootstrapping logic that you uh, agree to never overwrite. And actually, this is one of the other. This is one of the other code changes uh, that is proposed or that will be implemented for the PUC version four. Is that actually contracts they cannot modify their own storage any their own code anymore? So it will be separating the the byte code from the storage but you can still make a new contract with the modified uh, uh, instructions and then basically you would point to this new contract and call it from, from there. And this entire logic where you point to this new contract, you could have some kind of clause that if it is done for seven weeks without external acknowledgement, then it will revert to the previous version. But of course, all this logic you will need to implement yourself and need to properly test that, that at least that part doesn't have any, have any bugs. Yeah. Does the blockchain have any idea of time, or just number of confirmations? So um, the miners, they, the, the, there's a timestamp when the block was uh, created, was submitted. I believe that is somewhat validated, but there is a bit of fuzziness in, in there. A little bit of clock skew is possible. So you could maybe more reliably just use the block number as an indication of the of the time, or have some verification where you don't immediately act upon it, but you first you commit to some kind of change and then two blocks later you, you actually run on it. Because somebody... <laughs> Did Bitcoin crash? Okay, no? Good. So, for a lot of these, if it's really real, if you're paying out a million based on, on timestamps, something like that, yeah. probably it's better to be a bit more defensive and at least have it validated for one or two two increments. But we st again, still we have to, to see how that how that will be working. So just a very high level overview. Basically, this only does is allow people to vote for the, the rules of the organization to change. There's nothing with transactions yet or, or adding new members or, or payouts or dividends or whatever you want to do reputation with your organization, but of course, starting with this boilerplate, you can expand it. So one of the questions was, how do we interact with the outside world? What is possible? What are the limitations here? Um, <coughs> of course, this contract, it had members. So it was more like a community than a, than a commercial shareholder construction. So it could be a very um, 
So that's one of these terms for this is a decentralized autonomous community. You can have also a purely commercial organization where people have shareholders and they, they have dividends. Uh, you can even start with some kind of Kickstarter approach where people are uh, bundling their money together for your organization and if certain goals are reached, they will, get, they will start getting payouts. What's interesting here is that these members, these shareholders, these people that get payouts and that can vote, they could also be other organizations. So they don't need to be national people. Those could be other contracts. So you can build contracts on contracts on contracts all the way, all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you interact with the outside world? So if you want to have input, you cannot go to Bloomberg.com and get some stock uh, quotes. So you rely on data feeds. You rely on people that have that basically are calling a contract with the latest version of, the, of the, the, the latest value of the Bitcoin US dollar exchange rate. Um, so there's a, still a little bit of trust required with that, but there are all kinds of schemes to mitigate that. So you could have some kind of voting mechanism where you would calculate the average of, of 10 different data feeds and you would see who are the outliers and then you could vote on excluding them and you would penalize them if they cheat. So one of these proposals is this uh, a block entry again by, by Vitalik, a shelling coin minimal trust universal data feed very interesting how you can make a data feed and removing a lot of trust from getting outside data into into ethereum you can also work the other way around so a contract you could have a contract return a certain state and you could agree that somebody will i don't know open the the the, the gates of the city if this contract returns a one <laughs> instead of a zero still somebody needs to agree on it but again you could the contract could check itself based on the data feed, if it was actually happening or not. And if it's not happening, it will uh, pick another proxy to act upon it, or it will call the judge <laughs> and, and have forced us there. Uh, so question, you mentioned that you cannot go to Bloomberg and fetch the data from them. That Correct. Was because? Because of the, uh, we don't want to have this horrible viruses that, that start uh, um, doing all kinds of abuse of Ethereum, and you need to also, you need to rely, so, uh, sorry, so contract execution is deterministic. Once you give the certain input, it will always return this, this, this output. If you go to a website, if you have that website to be up or down as a dependency, maybe it works if the miner is based in China, but if you're in the United States, it doesn't work or the other way around. So you cannot rely on external data in that sense. So that is why it needs to be abstracted. That's why you need these data feeds and proxies to get input and to get to get output. If, if Bloomberg decides to set up their own imperial empire, will you then be able to fetch the data from them? So Bloomberg and, and uh, all the kinds of news agencies, so this might be their new business business model for, for them to provide data, sign data that can be verified, people can be using it and they get paid by by the by the, the consumers of their of their data. So this would be very logic for so them to set up. From Bloomberg, your Ethereum is still possible to exactly. Work. Yeah. Question? Yeah, you, you mentioned, I think, it, or someone else mentioned in the beginning that um, it, it, I mean, in order to read data, you need to pay as well. So if you have a contract that you have, you have a private memory space that yep. you want to read yep. that, you have to pay. So do I, do I have to interpret that as a business model for content providers? So for example, Bloomberg would insert its data in blockchain and people would need to pay to read that data? It used to be possible with the extra instruction to inspect the contact storage of another contract. So if you had this Bloomberg contract, everybody could basically look into the state of the Bloomberg contract they still need to pay a, a fee for this, but the fee wouldn't go to Bloomberg, but it would go to the miners. Mm -hmm. So this was removed for scalability reasons, but also to make this 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 as a business model more possible to have people charge for their uh, for their uh, for the data that they, they provide. Of course, somebody can just undercut it and just pay the fee once and then distribute it ten times for ninety five percent of the fee. So how does then would you be able to verify that this copying person? actually have the same data as the original. Well, you could, you could have some kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of option contract or some kind of a bet, betting contracts that will each time check that both are giving the same results. And if the, the results are more than 5% different, it will pay out 10,000 10, ether as, as collateral. Who knows? 
Yeah. Or you could just have a contract and it just returns immediately what the other one returns. And then it's stressless. So you well, but you, know be, you, would, you would need to call each contract to get a result, right? And there's a little fee uh, associated with calling yeah. them. So if you have thousands of contracts that you're calling, you will be much more expensive than this competitor that is basically only using Bloomberg itself. Casey? Do you access to, uh, so if a contract will return some sort of uh, a memory space, right, or whatever it's called, um, and that, that program within the contract, uh, in other words, it's a public like data feed like contract, um, are you paying only for the computing portion of what that contract is doing, or are you also paying to access the memory when you pay that contract? Depends how it's written. I Does that think, make sense? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're only paying, at that point, I don't think you're paying for reading its own storage. Okay. Somebody here has the white paper with him and we can check this, yeah, this sorry, afterwards. No, I, I, I think typically you're paying for updating the memory and, and changing it. Right. Uh, for just reading it within its own space. I think there is no... There's no, you said there's not a cost? There's a gas pump. There is, so there is a limit, there's okay. a limited cost for, for it. Okay. It's probably five times the amount is of... Is the storage space in a new version, is, is it going to be private? Yeah. Same. Yeah, someone said it like in the beginning. Yeah, it's pretty... But the contract would have to say this, this can be public. You know? Oh, okay. So you can then do like get access, etc. So it's like an API call. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's private for... For other contracts, but humans can just read it off the blockchain. Yeah, the client can read. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you're calling the contract uh, of Bloomberg, that will return you uh, some value. Yeah. Um, they can demand a fee for that and can get it, or is it? Yeah, they can minor? demand a fee for it. So they yeah, say, okay. I only give you the right value if you pay enough. Yeah. Maybe if you don't pay enough, I give you a wrong value. That would really uh, trigger you <laughs> to pay pay the right money. Yeah. yeah. So this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I've just showed you one example. I don't think anybody have actually executed that yet. That's, that's still on the, the to-do list for, for many of us. But to, to learn more about what's possible, I think really the Ethereum white paper and especially the, the new versions that is, that is required to just understand what's possible, what are the limits, how do these contracts interact with each other. Um, also, uh, Vitalik Buterin, the, the, well, the, the, the founder, uh, the, the, the thought leader, of um, Ethereum. Already last year, he wrote a couple of very interesting articles in the Bitcoin magazine about uh, bootstrapping a decentralized autonomous corporation. And while reading these three-parter, you can really see where he started to think about Ethereum and how his plan started to form. And he also listed a couple interesting uh, use cases out there. And now recently, he has two more entries about DAOs are not scary about the, the beneficial uses of them and how they will interact with the real world. Um, and we just have to see, we yet have to see if that is going to be a reality or not. And also on my uh, YouTube channel, Ethercast, together with uh, Joel Dietz from uh, Silicon Valley, uh, we are doing a lot of contract walkthroughs and we are discussing it and probably we also will be making our own decentralized autonomous organization for Ethercast itself. So that will be a very interesting uh, dog fooding exercise. So subscribe to ethercast.com and, and learn more about our efforts of, uh, of doing so. So just to, to finalize, I think there's a lot of possibilities with Ethereum. Doing this decentralized autonomous organization might be even the most challenging, the most interesting things. Even if it will be possible to have the Ethereum Foundation itself run as a decentralized autonomous organization on top of Ethereum, that will be that will be amazing. That won't be possible for the first first couple of versions, but they will be certainly trying to do so. If this is really going to work, if this is really going to be beneficiary, uh, we yet have to see. But I do think it's uh, it's very challenging. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, well, the, I mean, I think the idea of uh, EOS was kind of inspired by Bitcoin in the sense that Bitcoin is this thing that if you're a part of it in the beginning, you have an incentive to promote it, to, uh, to build tools for it, so to create an ecosystem. Um, so what I understand from 
the incentive of the, or the incentive behind creating the AOs would be that you have kind of shareholder like structure and as an initial, as a founder or as one of the early people you would have a, a big share of the ether to well, or maybe the coin its own coin and then you would have an incentive to promote the DAO and make other people use this structure. But do you see other business models or the drivers of the I mean drivers behind creating uh, DAOs? Isn't that called a corporation? Like if it's not a business, like to start a business? Sorry to answer well, what this question. first? So yeah, so like you have like somebody start something. Yeah, sure. And then I mean it's the same thing as, as yeah. being a founder of a company. The, like Bitcoin yeah. is inherently like per it's a pyramid scheme, right? So because there's well or an IPO or shots fired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I <laughs> sorry guys. Get out! <laughs> <laughs> I think Go to get next door to Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> so I think on a decentralized platform to get uh, reliable data, you need to be decentralized. You need you, you need to not have a central board of directors of people influencing it. So for these kind of data feeds, to implement a data feed contract and, and especially a reliable one, you will actually need to b b make this on top of such a decentralized autonomous organization where it will be modifying itself and paying people rewards for the, the, the quality of data that they're providing with it. So maybe their incentive is not so much to raise the money initially, but keep improving the services that the organization itself provides. And what that can be, maybe that's for data feeds, maybe that's for arbitrage, maybe that is for the ideal uh, doggy coin, catty coin uh, thing. Um, I, I'm not sure about that, but I think a lot of it is inspired by this crowdfunding, bootstrapping thing. Uh, Bitcoin, what, it's already too centralized with the mining pools and the ASIC miners in the Bitcoin Foundation and these kind of things. So can we take this to, a not, to, to the next level? Can we remove a lot of this central structure and, and implement it as code? I think that is the main, that's one of the main goals. And whatever you do with it, um, we, I'm, I'm not sure about that. The last thing about it is don't make it a business. Or make it a decentralized business. Well, this is just so business can actually happen, you know? This, this actually gets contracts out of the way quickly Absolutely. so we can get time to work. On the existing infrastructure. Yeah. And again, the infrastructure that, is not a business. that comes down to, I mean, if you just using this drag and drop interface where you just create your own your own contract, you run it, you submit it to the blockchain and you're in business without having to go to the camera for gold handle. Maybe maybe that's the biggest uh, advantage of this uh, of this system. It's, it's not just about business. You could do a pension fund for uh, insurance. is a particularly good model where there's an incentive as you grow larger. The incentive grows for people to actually grow and and and, and, and uh, look up more people. It's, it's these kind of collaborative models that we currently already have in our society. And it's just you have to formalize them. In <laughs> My problem with this is, is it, is it a good democracy? Is it, um, do we abide by the United Nations like men? Yeah, that depends on the contract. You say, well, yeah, but it's, it, it, but if, 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 my, if my little market. piece of yes, this is, is, be your is, 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 is in North Korea, I can say, <laughs> screw you all because yeah, I'm not mean, abiding by any. Yeah, so, uh, can I, hang on, so the question was, is this, thing, right? is this a democracy? Yes. So already this contract, one member had one vote. But of course, you could have like one agent that had 10 membership. So the enforcement of its own rules could also be done by the members. Yes, so as long as the member has enough ether to vote. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but you have to, you say we have to pay for this or pay for that. Um, the only enforcement you have is good money. Yes, that's, that's really funny, but if we all uh, vote for let's not pay any taxes, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you see, there's like a fundamental thing there. We're, I think I'm living in a democracy, but I can't vote for not paying any taxes. I think the first sure you can vote for, can vote for uh, it. Yes, but uh, we all want to vote for it, but... <laughs> <laughs> what? It's inefficient. Uh, I know, but 
how far does this thing go? This, this just, uh, it's just it's just contract. It's just agreement. So yeah. I mean, you're still a person living in the Holland, so you're bound by the laws that you know that are here. So it doesn't mean that you suddenly do all kinds of things in Ethereum that you're suddenly outside Holland. Okay. It's not snow packed, right? right. Like the important thing to keep in mind is Ethereum is more of a platform or like a protocol, as the the founders say. It's more like TCP/IP rather than anything that's trying like you don't make a business out of tcp ip like per se but you make a business on top of a stack of other things that casey was saying um and and i think a lot of the uh, questions that are coming up are, are, are social and cultural problems uh you won't get a lot of agreement between russia china and the united states in a lot of different matters, and I think that's probably something you'll see in Ethereum. However, Ethereum will be agnostic to all of it and still run everything. So, yeah. So, so, so I didn't read white papers. So maybe this is a pretty newbie question. But why they focus on contracts? Like, why, why not programs or whatever storage? They, they are. I mean, contracts? they are. They are programs, and there is storage. But I mean, storage costs. Technical uh, thermal closures. Yeah. Closures, okay. So. Uh, they, they were originally called contracts, and we kind of stuck with it. Um, I think there's a, an instance of a contract is now called a closure, uh, but saying these kind of things is uh, not really going to help clear anybody's uh, mindset at the moment. Um, but you can take a very abstract... Uh, if you take the term contract in this very abstract, abstract sense, it is a meeting of the minds, uh, and that's what all of our computers and uh, all of the systems we have in place are essentially doing at the moment. Um, but yes, they are. It's like a smart contract is a program. There's no, there's no, there's, it's it's synonymous. It's a confusing thing that as soon as you start using the word contract, you can start confusing them with, like, as I do and everybody naturally does, with contracts that you already have in paper. And that I, I think that's one of the goals, actually, because they're trying to compete with a lot of these contracts and they try to provide an interesting alternative while they're not trying to compete with Microsoft Word or on other general purpose programs. So I think it's that's why they, they picked contracts. And, it, and it, it is really inspired by a lot of the work by, by Nick Szabo on smart contracts. So this contract word, if you like it or not, I think it was already part of the of the, of the, 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 the culture, the subculture creating this. So that's why they, they, they stuck with it. But if it will be used by the end users, or if the end users will actually know that they're using Ethereum at all, probably probably not. Yeah, question. So that's a, a very uh, interesting piece of uh, infrastructure, and it's a uh, very interesting piece of infrastructure can create, uh, well, bit patterns, basically, in which other people might be interested. And so how exactly, can, so this is basically this outside world thing. I don't really see how a miner or whatever to connect to that, an arbitrary miner specifically. So I don't see how, uh, I, uh, the impression that it was the idea that uh, the code would be independent of everything, but I mean this interesting piece of infrastructure is never ever going to run on uh, this uh, Ethereum uh, virtual machine. So it's, it's just not going to happen. So it's basically impossible in some cases. So, so I think the question is how do miners benefit from all this? Is that the no? The question is, is how do they get the this, re this interesting bit pa bit pattern yeah. which was created by interesting infrastructure? Yeah. How do they do they get that to their whoever is paying the gas basically? So you will see, I mean, I have the impression that you, everything needs to be computed in this Ethereum virtual machine. And if that's the case, then it's a completely useless thing. Right. I mean, so, so, but you still, that's, that's you will still have APIs. So that's a bit too strong. I mean, it's too self-useful. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. No, no. Things which look like contracts in the real world in some sense would still be useful for those kinds of things. But for general purpose, uh, well, API access, basically, which is what lots of people apparently probably are interested in here, it's not going to work. But I mean, that's how I understand it. But now you're, you're supposed to say you've got it all wrong and it's this. <laughs> well, I, I, maybe like, you can answer yes. it. I, well, um, I, I kind of, I think I, I, I might understand you. Um, in the previous meetup, uh, I have uh, that introduction to smart contracts and I touch on smart properties a little bit. Um, you're right, it's not going to work in a lot of different cases, but say for example the case of a smart car. Now right now uh, in our current cars we have onboard uh, mechanisms that stop an unauthorized user from starting the car, like uh, someone who's going to like hotwire it or something like that. They've got an immobilizer, right? 
Uh, there's no reason why a manufacturer. Of course, this is not applicable today, but maybe in the future with some of these new cars, they could have an a, a customized Ethereum client that is of, uh, somehow connected to the internet that uh, integrates with the, uh, the car hardware itself. And therefore, you can then have some kind of contract running in Ethereum that will uh, monitor somebody's private key or tracks ownership of the car and which the car will then respond. Um, uh, the, is it hackable? Probably. Uh, but there are going to be mechanisms to circumvent that. Um, however, for something like um, a chair, like, and I'm tracking ownership of a chair, that's going to be much more difficult because we don't have this Internet of Things. Uh, yes. yes, exactly. But maybe this will come in the future, maybe not. Who knows? Isn't the question that there might be you want to store something or no, uh, yeah. transact something that's not representable in bytecode? No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, of course, I mean, it's, re it's representable. Just uh, to actually compute that object, basically, uh, that's not going to work in the actual Ethereum uh, virtual machine. So uh, if you have this arbitrary miner which needs to compute this thing, it's not going to work. I mean, you need the specific miner. So you need to, for example, for the Bloomberg API or whatever. Bloomberg had the information for their newsfeed, not all the miners in the world. No, it's, it's, so, so every miner will have the Bloomberg contract, but then Bloomberg uh, client will send a specific transaction to that contract. So then that transaction gets verified by all the nodes in the cluster. Okay, so and also everything needs to be verified by all the nodes. I mean, it seems like there are maybe like a few billion uh, nodes who which need to verify everything. They wouldn't be. They it's wouldn't be verifying. They wouldn't be verifying the uh, the actual. You're right. They wouldn't be verifying the data that's in the transaction per se. Like I mean, they will be verifying so there's consensus within the uh, network, but there would have to be ultimately some kind of trust at that gateway point between the real world when they send the transaction. But then you could also have another, a third party. Uh, and is it, so specifically this, this trust thing, so how exactly does that work? I mean, like technically, I don't see it. Uh, trust within the Ethereum network? Or I, I, I think we cannot really give you an answer within one minute or something. I think it's a really interesting discussion, but, I mean, but maybe this afterwards this we can have a chat yeah, yeah, about, about this. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there. Yeah, actually, this is a question that's more related to cryptocurrencies and blockchain, or general applications of blockchains. How the hell do we scale this? Uh, there's been some talk about Bitcoin having some, some scalability issues. Uh, and this will come to Ethereum as well, because you also have this computation intensive stuff. You have a lot more, uh, a lot, a lot more storage requirements. And my question is, do we actually need to have all the data everywhere? Is this necessary in the current... So a couple of weeks ago, uh, Vitalik gave a very good uh, presentation called uh, Hard Problems in Cryptocurrency. And I really uh, uh, would, uh, would uh, um, if you're really interested in the technical parts of this, really give, the, give that one a, uh, a try. Um, this is not solved yet. This is not a problem specifically for Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything. This, but what you're seeing... <laughs> it's a shared problem, but once somebody finds the answer to this, or at least an answer to improve it, it can be used by all these technologies. And you already see, even there's a lot of competition already with these cryptocurrencies, they're learning from, from cooperating, from research that they're, doing, that they're doing together. And by, I mean, that's also where part of this Ethereum fundraiser will go to, to pay for research and, and, and grants and these kind of things that are required to grow this to the next level to, to scale. So there are, there are a couple of thoughts out there already to take it uh, uh, to the next step. We just quickly jump over? Or? Mm, no, I wouldn't. Maybe maybe somebody else can give me a... Nick, do you feel comfortable giving a, a very high level summary on the scaling of Ethereum? Uh, no, it's the same, same problem. Um, there's, there's, uh, okay. there's, um, the same problem that Bitcoin has. I mean, I want to respond to the question earlier. Um, it's not like, it's not the idea that uh, the Ethereum blockchain would have all the data or all the computation. It's like a contract interface layer between parties. 
Uh, and it's going to sell up to uh, to the cost that you will pay for it. Same with Bitcoin. Storage costs Bitcoin, and uh, we transact making transactions cost Bitcoin. And if it becomes very expensive, you can maybe even only make very large transactions. Uh, scale up to a certain balance, and until it's fixed to the next level. Where basically, yeah, it becomes too expensive to do transactions, so it wouldn't become where you pay in your bar or your restaurant. Yeah, you can, there's an idea that the, the blockchain, uh, if it doesn't grow, it would create more uh, off chain transactions, for example. You have different blockchains or uh, more centralized systems around. All right, we'll take one more question and uh, then we'll wrap it up. Why is yeah. the default rate uh, first? Any idea what they're waiting for? Or? Uh, all I know for the fundraiser is they're going to make an announcement uh, in the next few days at uh, Bitcoin Expo in Toronto. Um, I don't, we don't know any of the de details until until then. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming today. Um, if uh, you're interested in presenting or if you've got a project, uh, please let us know. Uh, I know there's a few projects out there, by the way. Um, so. Yeah, like, that's it. Thanks.